welcome to this introductory session on gender perspectives on macroeconomic theory and policies. The main premise underpinning a gender-aware understanding of the macroeconomy is that macroeconomic policies, such as fiscal policies or trade policies, are implemented within economic structures that are shaped by gender norms and are characterised by distinct gender differentiated patterns. This fact has two important implications. It has implications for the distribution of costs and benefits between women and men, as well as between different groups of women and men, depending, for example, on their stage in the life cycle, ethnicity and place of residence. It also has implications for achieving macroeconomic objectives. We will start by outlining some core principles of feminist economics and its relevance for macroeconomics. This session will then explain what is involved in understanding the economy as a gendered structure, both conceptually and in terms of the data needed to paint such a structure. The second part of the session will focus on how to analyse the multiple links between macroeconomic policies and gender inequalities. It will list kinds of macro policies and domains of gender inequality or equality. It will explain the idea of two-way causality between gender relations and macro policies. We will then provide a few select examples of formal models and analytical frameworks. Some of the concepts and models introduced in this session will be seen again and further developed in later modules, including module 9 on international trade and module 10 on gender responsive budgeting. By successfully engaging with this module, you should be able to 1. Apply data and indicators to describe the gender features of an economy. 2. Distinguish between macroeconomic approaches that merely disaggregate economic agents by sex and approaches that fully integrate a gender perspective into economic analysis. And 3. Use insights from the gender statistical picture of an economy to identify channels through which macro policy interventions are likely to affect gender based distributions. So, what is feminist economics? We start with a quote from a group of well known feminist scholars Diane Elson, Karen Grohn, and Nilufar Chaitai, who contributed to two issues of world development specifically dedicated to gender and macroeconomics. These two special issues are seminal contributions which you are all encouraged to read. They say of the feminist economics paradigm, this paradigm refines the economic sphere of inquiry around a concept of the provisioning of human life, emphasising those things human beings need in order to survive and flourish, such as food and healthcare and their production through market work and other activities such as unpaid labour in the home and volunteer work in communities and social organisations. And furthermore, feminist analysis aims at presenting alternative visions of economic processes and using these visions to transform economic and social life so as to reduce gender, race and class inequalities and promote the expansion of people's capabilities. The quotes on the previous slide stress that well-being and adequate standards of living must be the central objective of economic policies. In other words, progress should not be measured only in terms of gross domestic product, or GDP. The quotes also emphasise the role of unpaid care work for both well-being and the functioning of the market economy. The implication of this is a vision of the economy as constituted of paid and unpaid spheres. Please note, unpaid work is also called care or reproductive work, often interchangeably in the literature. Later slides in this module, as well as module 4, We'll further elaborate on this aspect. Feminist economics also pays special attention to inequality in the distribution of resources and power. 
It highlights how unequal power relations underpin both labour markets and households and sees the latter as sites of both conflict and cooperation. Module 3 will discuss in depth theories of the household. Feminist economics also pays special attention to the intersection of disadvantage. In other words, it encourages us to expose how gender, combined with class, ethnicity, age, place of residence and migration status, generate particular vulnerabilities. The formulation of policies must take account of the compounded effect of these factors. Finally, feminist economics challenges assumptions such as rationality, self-interest and exogenous preference formation. For example, it encourages us to ask, do women really prefer to work as secretaries or nurses and to take on the bulk of care responsibilities? This module is specifically on macroeconomics and so it is useful to highlight here the feminist insights that are especially relevant to macroeconomic analysis and policy. The first contribution is to make unpaid household labour visible. This effectively reshapes the understanding of the conditions necessary for the functioning of the paid economy. The second insight is that gender is a category of social and economic differentiation that influences distribution of income and wealth, productivity of work and behaviour of economic agents. And the third important insight is that macroeconomic outcomes emerge from institutions such as firms, government, households and markets, all of which carry gender bias. Before we move on to develop the concepts and ideas that have just been introduced, it is important to stress what a feminist perspective on macroeconomics is not. First of all, Feminist economics does not say that women need a different economics to men. It is also important to acknowledge some useful contributions to gender-aware macroanalysis that exist within the neoclassical paradigm. These analyses usually focus on long-run supply-side effects of gender inequality in capabilities and can be used in support of instrumental arguments for gender equality. That is, the argument that reducing gender inequality is good for growth. For example, in the article titled The Impact of Gender Inequality in Education and Employment on Economic Growth, New Evidence for a Panel of Countries, Clausen and La Manna, 2009, demonstrate the positive effects of greater gender equality in education and health on economy-wide productivity and growth. They estimate that the combined cost of gender education and employment gaps in MENA and South Asia causes more than a one percentage point difference in growth compared to East Asia. But what about other domains of gender inequality such as wages and job quality and the unequal distribution of care work? We should not accept uncritically the view that economic growth leads to more equal gender relations. In fact, empirical evidence points to the contrary in a number of cases. Therefore, we need analytical tools and empirical investigations to identify, in each context, which patterns of growth are good for gender equality and which domains are affected and in what way. Before proceeding further, a few words of caution on what we gender scholars often call add women and stir approaches. As noted at the outset, one objective of this module is to help you distinguish between macroeconomic approaches that merely disaggregate economic agents by sex and approaches that fully integrate a gender perspective into economic analysis. Approaches that merely disaggregate economic agents by sex are not enough. One example of a simplistic disaggregation approach 
would involve a model that merely separates female and male labour factors of production, but then leaves model assumptions regarding rules of operation of labour market unchanged. In this case, disaggregating female and male labour becomes a mechanical way of reporting results and is of little heuristic value. A second, better approach would involve, in addition to disaggregating standard variables by sex, identifying missing variables with gender significance and bringing them into the model. For instance, one could add an unpaid care sector as a constant or resource to a model originally including only market sectors. A third and even better approach is to conceptualise the economy as a gendered structure. This means that the matrix of gender relations becomes an intervening variable in all economic activities and affects the functioning of market economy from within. Under this approach, different configurations of gender relations are reflected in different sets of model parameters. In the next slides, we take a few further steps towards applied gender-aware economy-wide analysis. We first elaborate on some of the concepts introduced in the previous slides. We then introduce a flurry of data to corroborate empirically the conceptual points made. And finally, we introduce an analytical framework that can be used to explore the multiple interactions that exist between gender inequalities and macroeconomic policies. The concept of economies as gendered structures emphasises that economies comprise both a paid economy, the output of which is counted as contributing to economic growth as measured by GDP, and an unpaid economy, which supplies goods and services directly concerned with the daily and intergenerational reproduction of people through their care, socialisation and education. Both the paid and unpaid economy are characterised by gender inequalities, such as the division of labour in which women have more limited access to paid jobs and occupations compared to men in the labour market and bear disproportionate responsibility for unpaid care and domestic work. Large businesses are often led by men and households are subject to internal gender inequalities in income, consumption, asset ownership and decision making. Building the statistical picture of a specific economy as a gendered structure requires collecting and analysing data on several dimensions. Later slides provide examples on how this can be done. As just observed, unpaid care work is not counted as contributing to economic growth, but it clearly makes an indirect, unmeasured contribution since Without this work, there would be no people to produce economic growth. This picture, taken from the cover of a seminal book within the body of feminist economic research, entitled Who Pays for the Kids? by Nancy Fulbright, vividly illustrates the point. Diane Elson's contribution to the identification of male bias in structural adjustment programmes is important in this regard. It paved the way for subsequent analyses of the gender effects of fiscal policies. It is one of the first and best articulated conceptual critiques of the International Monetary Fund and World Bank's early approaches to adjustment, pointing to gender bias in macroeconomic models and mainstream economic theory more generally. Elson's analysis emphasised how government budget cuts affected women and men differently. When the public sector downsizes, women are often the first to lose their jobs. When cuts are in social sectors such as education and health, which employ a larger share of women than other sectors, they may find it more difficult than men to relocate to other sectors because of gender structural barriers to transferring labor and other resources. Especially insightful it's her argument that women become shock absorbers whenever public spending on social services declines. 
This argument makes the point that women assume greater responsibilities in cushioning their family from the negative effects of reduced public provision and economic crises. Mainstream models of economic restructuring, such as those used by the World Bank in the era of structural adjustment programs, gave little attention to the implications for the unpaid care economy because of an implicit assumption that the unpaid domestic work and care sector would accommodate the changes induced by macroeconomic variables. Since women undertake most of the unpaid domestic work, this is equivalent to assuming an unlimited supply of female labour. Is women's capacity to work infinitely elastic? Elson highlights how public expenditure cuts to reduce budget deficits assume women's time and energy to be a limitless resource to be drawn upon at no cost to protect families' well-being from withdrawals of public services and declines in real incomes. But, she notes, too great a burden on the unpaid economy weakens women's capacity both to contribute to production that generates tax revenues and to maintain activities that promote well-being and social cohesion and it further restricts women's opportunities for rest. Elson reported, for example, that in Zambia, cutbacks in health expenditure were hampering women farmers who could spend less time farming because of the need to care for sick relatives. Elson, 1991. This example is used to demonstrate how macro policies might not reach their goals if gender effect are ignored. In further work, Elson conceptualises economies in terms of three spheres, introducing the sphere of finance in addition to the sphere of production and the sphere of reproduction. She uses this framework to explore the gender effects of the 2008 global economic crisis in developing countries. To summarise, the sphere of production includes goods and services produced for sale. The sphere of social reproduction slash care includes services concerned with daily and intergenerational reproduction of people as human beings. And the sphere of finance includes profit-oriented banks, central banks, ministries of finance, informal money lending and similar. For each of these spheres, Elsa notes, it is useful to distinguish gender norms and gender numbers. Gender norms are social norms that constrain the choices of women and men. These norms are difficult to change, but are changeable, and are further examined in Module 2. Gender numbers refer to six disaggregated statistics of various kinds. This categorization is mentioned here because it offers a starting point for assembling the data needed to build the statistical picture of the economy as a gendered structure to which we now turn. Building the statistical picture of a specific economy as a gendered structure thus requires collecting and analyzing data on several dimensions. With regard to the social reproduction sphere, Statistics are required on unequal patterns of time spent on unpaid domestic and care work, as well as usage of services that can reduce unpaid work, such as electricity, water and care services, possibly disaggregated by household income and place of residence. Data on public spending on social services can help in capturing the extent to which responsibility for care provision is shared between families, the state, and other institutions. With regard to the production sphere, it requires sex disaggregated data, not just on the quantity of employment, but also its quality, such as measures of gender-based occupational and sectoral segregation, types of employment contract, hours of work, workplace safety, gender earnings gap, as well as level of earnings. As a general rule, it is preferable to choose statistics that capture terms of inclusion 
and give some indication of women's capacity to achieve goals rather than merely counting them. For instance, when the information is available, it is important to report not only employment to population ratios, but also employment status. For instance, how many women relative to men are employers versus how many women relative to men are unpaid contributing family workers. Disaggregated data on financial governance and financial inclusion would also be critical for gender analysis, and it would be preferable to report the average size of loans women-led SMEs are able to obtain and the interest rate they must pay, for example, rather than simply the proportion of small-scale industries headed by women with a loan or line of credit, as in SDG 9.3.2. Whenever possible, data should be disaggregated not only by sex, but also by other factors such as stage in the life cycle, place of residence, rural versus urban, educational attainment and migration status of workers to capture how gender intersects with other sources of disadvantage. For example, it is widely documented that mothers of young children face a severe penalty in accessing quality jobs and earnings. Moreover, women aged 15 to 24 are overrepresented in less protected forms of work, such as temporary and gig employment, which means greater exposure to the negative consequences of economic crises compared to other labour market participants. Growing evidence shows also the vulnerability of those women who, after retirement age, in many countries, need to continue taking up precarious paid work to avoid poverty, and at the same time care for the grandchildren, sometimes their older husbands or even their own parents. Being an international migrant with low levels of formal education poses particular challenges for a woman and often exposes her to occupational risks and stigma. Module 8 discusses more in-depth issues regarding women and international migration. These are just examples which are further illustrated in the following group of slides. The slides present various pictures and graphs to highlight selected patterns in each of these spheres. We start with some statistics on the distribution of unpaid domestic work and care. The main objective of this slide is to show how you can combine data to highlight that the distribution of unpaid work has not only a gender dimension, but also a poverty dimension. For policy purposes, it is important to expose that not all women experience unpaid domestic work and care in the same way. It is low-income women who tend to bear the highest burden in terms of both drudgery and time intensity. This graph is taken from the latest UN Women's Report on Progress of the World's Women. It shows average minutes per day spent on unpaid and domestic work by sex and income quintile in selected Latin American countries. The green bars represent women's time, while the blue bars represent men's time. The most interesting insight from this graph is that while the average time men spend on unpaid work remains more or less the same across income quintiles, this is not at all the case for women. Women in any quintile spend more time than men on unpaid work, but women in the poorest quintile spend much more time than women in the richest quintile. This is likely explained by the fact that women in the poorest quintile have more limited access to household infrastructure that can reduce the drudgery of unpaid work, such as piped water and electricity. This hypothesis is somewhat corroborated by the next slide. This set of graphs are from another UN Women's Report on making inclusive growth work for women in Vietnam and refer to another region of the world, Southeast Asia. Please focus on the graph on the left, 
This graph shows how access to tap water is highly stratified and skewed against ethnic minorities and the poor. As you can see, less than 5% of households in the poorest quintile have access to piped water on premises, compared with almost 80% in the richest quintile. The graph on the right shows that access to tap water on premises also varies by region. It is very plausible to assume that in households without access to piped water, water collection and purification is carried out by women and girls. This is an example of the sort of data on household access to infrastructure that can give us insights into the likely burden of women's unpaid work by household type and still help in informing policies on infrastructural investment even when individual time use data are not available. Still on the theme of how income and gender intersect, this figure shows the typical childcare arrangement for employed women with children under the age of six. It shows that, in general, few employed women in developing countries have access to organised care. What is striking, however, is the difference between the poorest and the richest women. About 44% of women in the poorest group look after their own child, compared to 29% of women in the richest quintile. When it comes to sending a child to nursery or having a hired domestic helper looking after her, about 25% of women in the richest group do so compared with almost none in the poorest group. We now move on to a few slides illustrating gender differences in the productive sphere. This figure is from the ILO and shows employment status by sex in different regions of the world for the year 2018. The most striking aspect relates to the proportion of women and men who are classified as contributing family workers. Women remain overrepresented in this category in all regions of the world. This employment status involves working as self-employed in an establishment operated by a relative on either farms or small businesses in manufacturing or services. It is the most vulnerable form of work since it implies no independent access to income or meaningful say in the way the family business is managed. The figure shows that the gender gap for contributing family work is widest in low-income developing countries, where 43% of women and 17% of men were engaged as contributing family workers. This figure draws two on ILO data and shows the extent of gender-based sectorial segregation by region and its changes between 1997 and 2017. It confirms persistent gender segregation. This segregation is highest in the Arab states, followed by Northern Africa. Manufacturing is a sector with a relatively high concentration of women in some regions, such as Eastern Asia and Southeastern Asia, as well as Northern Africa, but with a relatively higher concentration of men in other regions, such as Northern America, Northern, Southern, Western, and even Eastern Europe, and the Arab states. Eastern Asia and Southeastern Asia tend to have an overrepresentation of women in whole and retail trade, as well as manufacturing. The highest relative concentration of women in agriculture is in South Asia, and to a lesser extent in Sub-Saharan Africa the Arab states, and Central and West Asia. Northern America and Northern, Southern and Western Europe have similar sectors and levels of segregation per sector. Predominant female concentration in education, health and social work, and relative male concentration in manufacturing, construction and transport, storage and communication. So there is variation across regions. But the main insight to take away from these data is that this sectoral segregation is stubborn and resistant to change. There is a rich literature providing reasons for the persistence of sectoral occupation segregation. 
See, for example, Borrowman and Clausen, 2020. And this is reviewed in other modules. This slide and the next provide selected data on gender differentials in access to land as captured by land ownership, shown in this slide, and farm manager in the next slide. This slide in particular shows that sole ownership of land is rare among women in any country. For example, it amounts to just 4% in Nigeria and about 15% in Vietnam. Joint ownership seems more common, but still below 50% in countries like Ethiopia, Tanzania and Uganda. The Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, of the United Nations is a good source for this sort of data. Here, we are still looking at gender differentials related to land, but using the concept of agricultural holder rather than owner of the land. An agricultural holder is a person who is responsible for managing resources and taking technical and economic decisions. The data presented in this table refer to sub-Saharan African countries only, mostly draw on agricultural censuses and are for different years. Female management is below 35% in any country except for Cape Verde, and the data seem to suggest a different pattern between West African countries, where female management is 10% or below, and East and Southern Africa, where the proportion tends to be higher. Another important dimension of gender differentiated access to productive resources and opportunities relates to technical skills. Women's ability to acquire technical skills on a par with men would enable them to access a wider and better remunerated range of jobs. The proportion of new entrants into tertiary education by field of education and sex can constitute a useful indicator to capture this aspect and is reported in figure 7.1 taken from UNESCO sources and referring to OECD countries in 2014. Yet again, these data show women at a disadvantage in that they are underrepresented among new entrants in science, technology, engineering and mathematics (STEM) fields. For instance, they represent less than 30% of all new entrants in engineering as captured in the last blue bar on the right. Data on gender gaps in access to financial resources tend to be sparser and more difficult to document, particularly in low-income economies. This figure is from an OECD report on entrepreneurship in OECD countries. It shows the proportion of individuals who answered yes to the question on whether they had the money needed if they wanted to start or grow a business. The blue bars represent women and the little white diamond sign above the bars represent men. It shows that a smaller number of women than men responded yes to this question, invariably and across countries as diverse as Turkey and Australia. As you may have already concluded while studying the previous tables and figures, assembling all these data at the country level requires examining many sources and surveys. Labour force surveys, household and living standards surveys, enterprise surveys, time use surveys and other surveys on more specialised issues such as WASH or childcare provision, when available, and administrative data from relevant ministries are all potential sources of sex disaggregated data. Ideally, these data sources should be used in combination with each other as well as other non-sex disaggregated data such as national accounts. Whenever possible, preference should be given to surveys that are conducted regularly and enable frequent updates. Moreover, it is good practice to supplement statistical snapshots with studies that examine the evolution and determinants of unequal gender patterns over time.
although this may not always be feasible. As a way of summing up this part on gender statistics for building the picture of the whole economy as a gender structure, this slide offers you a reminder. We hope that the presentation of selected gender statistics in the previous slides has demonstrated the importance of going beyond headline indicators, such as female labour force participation rates or closing gender gaps in educational enrolment. Researchers who are serious about carrying out rigorous gender-aware economic analyses need to pay attention to how different source inequalities intersect and to terms of inclusion and not just participation. They also need to pay attention to whether gender gaps are closing because numbers for women are improving and not because numbers for men are going down. For example, a reduction on gender wage gap due to men's wages falling relative to women's wages is not a desirable result. Moreover, Gender-aware analysis should strive to always take account of the interdependence between paid and unpaid spheres, either explicitly or implicitly. Finally, it is important that researchers do not accept unquestionably gender myths such as that female-headed households are always the poorest of the poor. Data gaps evidently remain but many insights can be gained from existing surveys. Governments have two major tools at their disposal to manage the macroeconomy. These are fiscal policy, which in turn includes government taxation and spending, and monetary policy, which is about central bank interventions to influence the money supply, rate of interest, availability of credit, and exchange rate. Trade policy, involving tariffs and imports as well as export subsidies and taxes, is another type of macro-level policy. Because macroeconomic policies deal with aggregates, such as GDP, growth, inflation, exports and imports, they are often thought mistakenly as gender neutral. But, as earlier slides make clear, macroeconomic policies matter a great deal for gender equality and the well-being of all because they set some of the key parameters that delimit individual entitlements and the provision of public goods. Macroeconomic policies determine the level of employment, the availability of public services such as healthcare and education, and the degree of social protection. In general, they define the space within which citizens can claim resources for implementation of projects at the sectoral and local level. Labour market policies and institutions are also a significant element and play an important role in mediating the effects of macro policies on gender inequality. The next slides introduce the concept of two-way causality between gender relations and macroeconomic policies and also illustrate different domains of gender inequality. Both conceptualizations are useful for understanding the way gender inequalities and macroeconomic policies interact. Economic policies that do not take account of the gendered features of an economy and are formulated without consideration of the possible interactions between gender inequalities and specific interventions are said to be gender blind. One of the main objectives of this course is to show how to make economic policies gender aware. The relationship between gender and the macroeconomy is said to be a two-way relationship because, on one side, gender inequalities affect macroeconomic outcomes. For instance, some types of growth depend on the maintenance of gender inequalities in wages as is frequently the case in labour-intensive export-led development, an aspect of which will be further explored in Module 9. This type of growth may generate short-term benefits, but holds back the investment in human capacities required to move to a higher productivity economy in the long term. On the other side, different kinds of macroeconomic policies 
ranging from taxes to public spending, affect gender inequalities in different domains. Some policies are gender equalising, while others worsen gender inequality. The reasons for this will become clear in subsequent slides. But first, it is useful to define the different domains in which gender equality or inequality can be measured. The first step in exploring the effect of gender on the macroeconomy is to identify the domain in which we measure gender inequalities or equalities. This is essential since some types of gender inequality may have a negative effect on macro-level outcomes while other measures will have a positive effect. Moreover, some types of gender inequality impact the macroeconomy in the short run and others only have an effect with a lag. Broadly speaking, the gender distribution of well-being can be grouped into three domains, capabilities, livelihoods and voice slash security. The capabilities domain encompasses human abilities or functionings necessary to lead a good life. See Robbins, 2005. These include education, health and nutrition and are preconditions for self-realisation as well as production and economic decision-making. The second domain, livelihoods, or access to and control over resources and opportunities, refers to the ability to use capabilities to generate a livelihood to support oneself and one's family. The relevant indicators of gender equality in this domain will differ by the structure of production in economies. For example, where there are well-developed labour markets, representative measures are wage rates and various employment indicators. Gender gaps in livelihood in agricultural economies characterised by widespread subsistence production may be better captured by measures of land ownership access to credit and time spent in unpaid work. The third domain, voice and security, measures gender differences in the ability of individuals to shape decision making in the productive sphere, for instance, in the workplace and in the political process. Women's share of professional and managerial positions and of leadership positions in cooperatives, businesses and governing bodies are sometimes used as relevant indicators. Security is related to gender differences in vulnerability to violence and conflict. Note the data presented in earlier slides, specifically slides 15 to 23, mainly refer to the second domain listed here. In other words, they illustrate the diversity of gender gaps in livelihoods. The next set of slides deal with channels that go from gender inequalities to macroeconomic policies and outcomes. Now we're going to look at how the relationship from gender inequalities to economic growth is articulated in the literature. Research shows that gender gaps in education, health, unpaid labour, employment and wages have economy-wide consequences and influence the rate of growth. The effects are transmitted via both the supply side of the economy, principally through labour productivity, and the demand side through business spending, exports, saving and the balance of payments. Theoretical perspectives influence the way gender gaps are incorporated into models, with neoclassical economists focusing on long-run supply-side effects, while other schools of economists tend to emphasise the demand and supply-side in both the short and long run. As already mentioned in earlier slides, gendered neoclassical accounts emphasise the positive effects of gender equality in capabilities, in particular, women's health and education. There are several pathways by which capabilities equality can raise economy-wide productivity. 
If innate abilities are similarly distributed across the genders, unequal educational investments in favour of boys lead to inefficiencies due to a selection distortion problem. Overinvestment in less qualified males and underinvestment in more qualified females. This can lower economy wide efficiency, implying that gender equality in educational investment can stimulate economic growth. Several studies provide empirical support for this hypothesis, such as Clausen and Lamana. 2009. One criticism to this approach, most notably from Stephanie Segrino, is that it fails to recognise a few possible obstacles in the process along the way. For example, it neglects the fact that power and hierarchy can lead to inefficient but profitable production methods, making gender equality a viable contributor to economic growth at least in the short to medium term. Heterodox approaches differ from neoclassical growth theory in a number of ways. First, they underscore that the growth of potential output or supply must be matched by the growth of demand, itself influenced by the distribution of income. Second, they recognise that the ability to hire women at low wages due to their weaker bargaining position relative to capitalists can be a stimulus to investment. Moreover, in developing economies that rely on imported intermediate and capital goods to industrialise, low wages of women workers segregated in export industries can generate much needed foreign exchange, thus releasing balance of payments constraints. To conclude this discussion on the direction from gender inequality slash equality to macroeconomic growth and outcomes, it is worth referring to one particular formal model that has been developed by Chartai and Arturk as a contribution to a special 1995 issue of World Development. As noted earlier, there are two special issues of world development entirely devoted to gender fiscal adjustment, international trade and macroeconomics, one published in 1995 and one published in 2000. That should represent reference readings for any macroeconomist interested in gender-aware analysis. For the purpose of this course, two formal models are reviewed, the one developed for the paper Macroeconomic Consequences of Cyclical and Secular Changes in Feminization an experiment at gendered macro modelling is reviewed in the next few slides. The model developed for the paper The Formal Structure of a Gender Segregated Low Income Economy by Darity examines the different ways in which different configurations of gendered power could affect promotion of agricultural exports through devaluation. The model is only mentioned here for reference, but reviewed in detail in Module 9 on International Trade. In order to analyse the prospects for recovery in an economy undergoing adjustment, Artuk and Chartai develop a growth cycle model in which the care economy is modelled as a substitute sector for the market economy, and output is a function of the gap between savings and investment. They include, among other macroeconomic variables, the degree of feminization of the labour force and the intensity of unpaid female household labour. They posit a link between the degree of feminization of the labour force and investment. They also posit a link between the intensity of unpaid household labour and savings. More specifically, women's wages are lower than men's wages, hence reducing labour costs. This means that the feminisation of the labour force is positively related with investment in that it increases the profit-wages ratio. The link between the intensity of unpaid household labour and savings is related to the fact that households, which must save, tend to do so 
by substituting consumption of market goods for unpaid goods produced at home by female unpaid labour. During a contraction, female labour time expands, both in paid work and in unpaid work. A Turk and Chartai's formal model demonstrates that, if the feminisation impact on investment is smaller than the feminisation impact on savings, then the contraction of the economy will worsen. Conversely, if the feminization impact on investment is greater than the feminization impact on savings, then an economic recovery will be stimulated. In other words, their analysis shows that for a recovery to succeed, the impact of feminization of the labour force on investment must be stronger than the impact of the intensity of female household labour on savings. This is more likely to be the case in high and high middle income countries. We now move to explore the other direction of the relationship between gender and macroeconomic policies. That is, the channel from macroeconomic policies to gender inequalities. The discussion in the following slides is simply an introduction to give you a flavour of the main argument. Many of the issues introduced here are further developed in modules 9 and 10. The analysis of the gender distributional impact of economic policies starts from the premise that the economic lives of women and men are diverse. They differ in terms of activities, motivations, institutional and cultural contexts. Importantly, both women and men have multiple roles in the economy as producers, workers, care providers and citizens who pay taxes and are entitled to public services. They are therefore affected by macroeconomic policies such as fiscal policies or trade through three main channels. The employment channel, the consumption channel and the public provision channel. The employment channel has to do with the fact that sectors that expand or contract due to policy reform may require different kinds of workers, differentiated not only by skill but also by gender. The consumption channel relates to the fact that changes in relative prices and range of goods available affect socio-economic groups differently due to differences in consumption needs and patterns, which are shaped by gender. The public provision channel regards possible group-specific and gender-specific changes in the availability and quality of public services and terms of access. For instance, because of their caring responsibilities, women tend to rely more than men on public provision of childcare and healthcare. The gender-aware literature stresses how there are likely to be trade-offs and contradictions between different outcomes, such as that women may gain in some dimensions but suffer setbacks in others. This is the case when, for instance, a particular policy intervention increases women's opportunities for paid work but also increases their total work burden. The next slide is an example of a framework reflecting some of these conceptualizations. It contains a diagram mapping the chain of gender effects that public investment in social infrastructure could generate. In module 9, we provide another application using the employment consumption public provision framework in a diagram to spell out the various gender effects of trade. This map is taken from work by Ipek Ilkarachan, whose research focuses on estimating the costs and benefits of increasing public investment from a gender perspective. It is presented here to illustrate the many gendered interactions that can be triggered by a specific kind of social spending. She and her colleagues at the Levy Institute have applied this framework to a number of countries to demonstrate how public investment in care infrastructure, also called social infrastructure, has the potential to generate greater benefits for women's employment and wages 
than public investment in other sectors such as road and transport. A few points to note in this diagram. The first is that investment in social infrastructure has gender effects both on the supply side and the demand side. This creates the possibility of good synergies if policies are well designed. The diagram takes you through the effects of an expansion of the Early Childhood and Care Services, ECEC, for example, step by step. On the supply side, expansion of ECEC can significantly contribute to alleviating women's unpaid care work constraints and enable them to increase their labour market participation. This expansion is also likely to have many positive effects on children, enhance their cognitive skills and thus contribute to reducing socio-economic inequalities. On the demand side, ECEC expansion is likely to generate disproportionately more jobs for women since this sector tends to be female intensive. This in turn is likely to decrease gender gaps in employment and possibly in wages and may lead to a decline in both income poverty and time poverty. In sum, a great win-win scenario and a great way to conclude this first module. This final slide summarises the main learning points in this module. We stress the importance of considering multiple sources of gender inequalities at the macro level and taking into account both paid and unpaid sectors as constitutive elements of the macroeconomy. We reviewed a range of data that can be used to expose unequal gender patterns in an economy in sum, we stress the need to take a holistic approach to gender analysis and macro policy. We also explained both sides of the two-way causality between macro policies and gender relations. Finally, we showed how macro-level policies can either reduce or widen gender gaps. A range of factors and preconditions are likely to influence final outcomes, which both researchers and policymakers need to take into account when carrying out analyses, designing and implementing policies. Some of these factors and preconditions will be explored in other modules of this course.